Hello, welcome to a critical time in the revolution. Yay, or like, nay, whatever. I don't know who you're rooting for, so it was it was stupid of me to assume. Um, here are some more key terms and people. All right, so um, we've proclaimed our independence. We have said, hey, I don't like you anymore. I'm not sure if I liked you very much to begin with in the first place, to be honest. And the thing is, is like the British aren't really that worried. They're like, okay, cool. We'll just, you know, put down this um, little rebellion with our really awesome army that we have that has defeated everybody. And I don't think you have that same kind of army, do you? Um, by mid-1776, our heaviest fighting have shifted from New England, because remember, we have everything starting in New England with the Boston Tea Party and then the blockade of Boston and all of that fun stuff. It starts up there, and we start to shift to the middle colonies. This is where our Continental Army um, loses and loses and loses again and continues to lose and it's 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 not a great moral thing for them morale is low um in june of 1776 there is a large british fleet so remember when you say fleet i mean sometimes they refer to like cars like a fleet of cars but it just it's like any kind of vessel can you apply the word vessel to cars i don't know maybe we have Sir William Howe, who is a um, British commander. He gathers all of his forces on Staten Island, home, many years later, to Pete Davidson. I wonder if we knew that. It's at the southern edge of New York's harbor. Washington is expecting this. He is expecting Howe to attack. He's like, okay, when are we going to do this? Huh? When are we going to do this? And summer is warring time. You don't fight in the winter because it's cold and you, you can't use the environment to feed your people off of. So you, you, you fight in the summer and we're in June. So we have this whole thing that's going on. Um, Washington's army is not going to be able to take on this army that Howe has. He has 34,000 troops and 10,000 sailors. Plus, he also has, like, boats that are small guards and the ones that they sailed over on who can then, like, you know, like, hey, all, everybody, load in, load in the bus, and we're going to go, and we're going to fight some people. Summer sees a very long series of battles. Um, they battle, and the Americans retreat. They battle, and the Americans retreat. This is this is something that the British thought. They're like, oh, God, we're going to win this thing like in no time at all. The Battle of Long Island happens in August of 1776, uh, and the British drive Washington's troops out of Brooklyn. After that, Washington has to actually abandon the entire city of New York because of this. The um, city of New York stays in British hands for the rest of the war. It never ends up back in Patriot hands until there's a an actual surrender. The British are chasing the Americans. They go north to White Plains, and then they go south and west to Jersey. Um, during our fight for New York, so while... The British are going, God, why are these people, will they just stop already? Will they just stop already? I want to have my tea. Um, Nathan Hale is an American who volunteered for spying. He was supposed to collect all the information about British battle plans on Long Island. He is caught behind enemy lines. He is found to be a spy. He is tried. He is condemned to death. He's hanged the next morning. Later, um, the legend goes, it's probably not true, but, you know, it, it makes for a nice story. 
Um, he is he is credited with having said, I, sorry, I had to go on to the next slide. I only regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. Yeah, whatever. Okay, so as the British are chasing, the Continentals keep retreating. It's December. The American army crosses the Delaware River into Pennsylvania. The British are now like, hey, we're going to take Philadelphia. We'll do that. That'll be fun. Remember, at this point in time, Philadelphia is one of the most cosmopolitan cities in the world. Sort of. In that side of the world, world we'll say. Um, the spirits of your patriots are very low because we are losing handily. A lot of soldiers were like, look, you know, like this was fine at first, but I'm not going to stay on a losing team. I'm going to buy. I'm going home. Thomas Paine is kind of like encamped with these people. He is um, trying to keep morale up. He writes a, another pamphlet. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to call it a book. It's called The Crisis. So the first one that he writes is Common Sense. The second one is The Crisis. The Crisis is written because it, it's a literal crisis. Like the, we are losing men. We may not have enough people to fight with. His, the, this particular piece of writing is well known for the following quote. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of his country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. So that's a big deal. Basically, like, if you, you know, if you're in this for, like, while it's good, you're not going to, like, you're, you, it's not going to be easy, basically. This fight is not easy. Don't expect it to be. And all these people that are fighting with us, that are putting up with these privations and these terrible situations, like, they're going to... They're going to be the ones that are looked at as heroes, not you people that were here when it was nice and fun and seemed like summer camp, and then it got cold, and, you know, you lost a couple of toes to frostbite, and now suddenly you're going to abandon this patriot cause. That does not sound like a very brave person, in my opinion. Washington has this particular um, pamphlet read aloud to his troops because, again, literacy and, and all that kind of stuff. And Washington says to himself, self, we are not going to be able to win this war with traditional means. It's just not going to happen because we don't have traditional armaments. Like I was saying, you don't really fight in the winter. You might make a couple of, um, you know, a couple of like little troop movements here and there, but mostly they just kind of like huddle together for winter. But on Christmas night of 1776, Washington leads his men, 2,400 of them, across the Delaware River. These soldiers are huddled in the boats because it's cold. And a lot of these troops did not have shoes. They are marching in Delaware, Pennsylvania area in the wintertime, no shoes. It is freezing. They march while it is snowing, and to keep their feet from freezing, they would, like, the ones that didn't have shoes would wrap rags around their feet. But once they finally get on the bank, Washington's like, nah, we're going to do this. We've come this far. We are not turning back. So early on December the 26th, Washington and his men attack the city of Trenton, New Jersey, from two sides. And they just completely surprise the people that they are attacking. Um, this brings a, an astounding, like an astounding and a certain American victory. Your soldiers that are in Trenton are what are called Hessians. Um, there is a place in Germany called Hesse. And in fact, George III's, well, mm, I got to think. Grandfather, great grandfather, 
His great-great-grandmother um, was the Electress of Hanover, which is in Hesse. So you get like, wait, no, maybe they aren't in Hesse. No, Hanover's not in Hesse. Hanover's its own thing. Sorry. It is in Germany. These are German people. And um, they've been hired to fight for the, for, for the British. They aren't fighting for anything. Like, they're just being paid. The UK is like, hey, can we, like, hire some of your men, like, your guys to come and fight with us? Because, you know, we need, we need to look like we're really popular. Washington's army captures almost a thousand Hessian mercenaries. I can just imagine the Hessians that are like, oh, this is cold and not fun to do. I don't like it. Um, and then suddenly, you know, you have all these like random people barely dressed coming out of the woods. So the British are chasing the Patriots as Washington and his troops are moving out. Um, the soldiers, the American soldiers actually make camp near Trenton and they light all these campfires. And then afterwards, um, they pack up and they leave. So it looks like they're all camped out close to the city and they've already left. This is when, and it, by the time that like the British realize that they're not there, um, they go and attack Princeton. So this is how we're moving through New Jersey at this point. Oh man, I keep forgetting to like hit my thing. Okay, so Saratoga. The Battle of Saratoga is what I'm pretty sure every single history book I've ever read ha has said was the turning point of the Revolutionary War. It has to do with, it starts with our British General John Burgoyne. He wants to cut New England off from the rest of the colonies because if we remember correctly, New England doesn't have the natural resources that the southern colonies do. And basically, if you divide and conquer, you can do this much easier, much, with much more ease. There we are. So his plan is, okay, we're going to march from Canada. And we are going to move in three directions. We are going to move towards Albany. And we want to attack Albany. So from up in Canada, there's an army of 8,000. They move south to capture some forts on Lake Champlain, Lake George, and then like the upper area of the Hudson River. And from the west, he's like, look, they're going to move through the Mohawk Valley towards Albany. And then he's like, General Howe, your turn is to come up from New York City. So we're going... <sighs> He did not know how to pack lightly. And he, there, he and his baggage train, he had to look good. Um, they are moving very slowly through New York State. And because of this, the timing isn't right. Burgoyne, hold on, how do I explain this? So George III tells Hal to go south because he really, really wants Philadelphia. So instead of marching north to meet up with Burgoyne, Howe is following directions from the king to march toward Philadelphia. And so because Howe's forces are marching away from everybody, um, the American forces are able to kind of come back behind where Howe's troops have marched south and cut off British troops that are coming through, that are supposed to come through the, front, blah, 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 from, um, through the Mohawk Valley. So this is all like a, a strategery thing. That's not a word. Burgoyne leaves in June. He captures Fort Ticonderoga, which... If I'm recalling correctly, so now I can't, I'm not going to tell you the story because I keep getting like instances of the troops either winning or taking forts or whatever. I am getting it all mishmashed up in my head. 
confused with the French and Indian War too. So I'm gonna, I was gonna tell you a story and I'm not gonna do that now because I cannot remember if it is French and Indian War or Revolutionary War and it's not that important for you to hear. Um, they capture Fort Ticonderoga, the British do. The Americans had already captured it. And I guess I'm gonna have to tell you the story. I'm pretty sure that this is when um, like the Americans just kind of like walk in to the fort and it's very, very low staff. And they're kind of like, hey, we're capturing you. And the people there were like, what? Uh, okay, sure, take the fort. But at this point, this is when, um, June is when Burgoyne takes it back from these Americans. They push south and it's these baggage carts. Like they do not have the supplies put in situ. It's, it's not available for them to kind of like um, graze on the countryside. That's a weird way to put it. But yeah, they don't get to do that. So they have this long, heavy baggage train. But Americans are, they are moving quick. They are hot footing it. Um, after, hold on, I lost my spot. Da, da, da. Okay, so by September, we have a commander named Horatio Gates. He was mentioned in the Patriots. And he has 6,000 men, and they're like, we're going to fight. We're going to do it. It's going to be great. And at Saratoga, this is where they decide to make their stand. And it's in New York State, northern New York. And the Americans surround the British. And they start fighting. Fighting, fighting, fighting. They stop for a little bit. Fighting, fighting, fighting. Eventually, the <laughs> Burgoyne is forced to admit defeat. And he goes, all right, I am surrendering my army to the Americans. And it happens on October 17th, 1777. One of my favorite dates because I can remember it. Um, this is a huge, like I said, this is a turning point for the war. Previously to this, a lot of our foreign powers didn't really want to get involved because they kind of saw, like, they were like, I don't even know if this is going to work. Like, I, we don't want to put any of our own forces or money or funds or support or whatever behind a losing proposition. We don't want to do that. So they're kind of waiting to see. And it's this American victory where they are capturing... I mean, Burgoyne's force was huge. 8,000 men. Right? Hold on. Where did I get 8,000? No, I think I was right. Yeah, 8,000. Um, 8,000 men are marching south. And this is how many get taken at the Battle of Saratoga. So now the British are not... They're not going to be able to establish themselves a supply a resupply region in Canada because once you capture someone's army they are no longer allowed to play in the game and they have to go home that's kind of what they did because the patriots were like we ain't got nowhere to put you like just promise me you're not going to come back and join somebody else's army okay okay this convinces that your europeans are Sorry, this convinces the Europeans that the Americans are, they stand a chance of winning. And this is like, we really needed this win. Like, for the Patriots are sitting there and they're like, eh, I don't know about this. This is like, we are losing bad and this is embarrassing. So the French come through. Um, France openly supports American independence after the Battle of Saratoga in February of 1778. France formally so forms an alliance with the United States. Um, they, they're just this really, they have beef with Britain. France and Britain are like, let me think. Okay, Taylor and Kanye. It's just never going to happen. They're never going to be friends. They might pretend and they might take like a couple of pictures together. And, you know, like maybe if they're being attacked by like, Hitler, they'll come, well, I don't know about Kanye now. Maybe that was not such a great example. Anyway, they hate each other. Um, and the French are like, let's, let's, let's continue to, you know, sabotage, saboteur the um, British. 
The French, though, don't want to take an open stand until it seems like the Americans might win. I can't remember what class it was in, but somebody was looking up. Oh, what was it? I think it was actually B period. I think B period was looking up like weird, random racial slurs. And one of them was like frog eating, cheese smelling, surrender monkey for the French. And I was like, while I don't think that's a formal slur, it seems like a long thing to say when you're just insulting people. Um, it's very creative. So there's that. In February 1778, France becomes the first nation to sign a treaty with the United States. And France enters into a war with Britain alongside allies in the Netherlands and Spain. So by getting France to bait the British into a war in Europe, you now have an army that is split up by continent, by like an ocean, like they're on different continents and not like Asia, Europe continent difference, not even like Europe, Africa continent difference. We're talking like giant ocean in the middle. And when you split your focus, none of them are getting the best of you. So also our British now can't just send all of their troops to America. Like this is not something that they can do. They've got to now fight these other people. And so America's like, ha ha, this is great. This is, this is fantastic. A lot of Europeans um, volunteer to serve with the American military. Um, they think that, you know, the struggle for liberty is awesome. Many of them will end up regretting this action when they are executed during the French Revolution, but we're not quite there yet. Um, there's a French noble named the Marquis de Lafayette, and he is a high-ranking officer in Washington's army. He and Washington, um, they're friends, but more than that, it's kind of like a father-son relationship. Washington never had children of his own. He never fathered children. Um, people think it was because of the fact that he may have caught, like, the mumps or smallpox or something that made him sterile. So he never has children of his own, but he is like a really great mentor to a lot of um, younger founding fathers and people who are important historically. So he, and in fact, the Marquis de Lafayette names one of his future sons, George Washington de Lafayette. So like, it's, it's like a, it's a thing. Um, when Lafayette gets wounded in battle, Washington is like, you better, he looks at the doctor, he's like, you better take care of him. Like, he was my son. Don't mess up. And the surgeon said, yes, sir. And then they immediately drained him of two pints of blood. So volunteers from Poland, of all places, also make vital contributions. And it's not like, it's not formally Poland at that time period, I don't believe. I'm a little foggy on that because Poland is just taken advantage of for a very long time. It gets absorbed into the Russian Empire and then Catherine the Great's like, oh my God, I'm so sick of this boyfriend. I know what I'll do to get rid of him. I'm gonna name him King of Poland, perfect. Um, that happens and then just all kinds of things. But anyway, so these people from what we would see as Poland, um, they also contribute to our war effort. Thaddeus Kosciuszko is an engineer. He actually takes charge of building fortifications at West Point. And um, West Point is actually primarily an engineering school, I believe I read somewhere. Could be making that up, but I don't think I am. There's a guy named Kazimir Pulaski who trained and led cavalry which are on horseback, and the way you remember that cavalry are horseback soldiers is because cavalry sounds kind of like calves, which are baby cows, which are kind of like horses, and there we have it, soldiers on horseback. Thank you.
you're going to remember that for the rest of your life because you didn't believe this woman is stupid and insane and I cannot believe this is how I'm going to remember what a cavalry is. So um, Baron von Steuben is also a great help to the Continental Army. And interestingly, more recent scholarship has kind of looked into who Baron von Steuben was because he wasn't a baron. He just like, called himself that. Uh, I don't know. He was like, hey, nobody, nobody knows. They'll think that I'm really like awesome. Um, he had served in the Prussian army, and the Prussians were just the military guys. Like the British may win a lot, but the Prussians were still better at the winning. And, but anyway, so more recent scholarship is wondering if Friedrich von Steuben was either a um, intersex individual meaning um, the biological sex of, him, of this person was not determined. Um, the genotype and phenotype may not have necessarily matched. There's also, um, I mean, there's heavy evidence that at the very least, if Friedrich was a man, he was definitely a gay man. Like, there is no question he was like he leaves all of his money to his very good friend whom he shared a tent with I think we can all get there anyway Steuben um arrives and he's looking around and he's like you Americans are terrible like you don't know what you're doing you're poorly trained you have no discipline he teaches them how to march he teaches them how to shoot he teaches them how to attack with bayonets um, basically, he gets a bunch of people who have guns and turns them into an army. Americans are very good at providing the guns, sometimes not so good at actually providing the discipline. Um, all right, so most Americans know Valley Forge, or they may not know what it is, but they've heard the words. If you haven't, if you don't know what it is, um, this is when Washington's army suffers for during winter from 1777 to 1778. So remember, 77 is when the Battle of Saratoga happens in October. And so we're on a high. We're like, yeah, we won. We're going to do this. It's going to be awesome. Um, and the Americans are then like, cool, we won. Now we're, let's go into like winter quarters. They build a camp at Valley Forge. This is located in Pennsylvania, and I have been there, even though not recently I was a child. But anyway, it is not really that like exciting, and I'm a history person, and I'm still like, it's just a bunch of houses. Okay. Um, so the Americans are like in camp in this like kind of slum place. It's freezing. And then 22 miles away from there in Philadelphia, the British officers are um, having balls and fun, fun and merriment in the winter time because the Patriot troops eventually, like they had to abandon Philadelphia. It broke Benjamin Franklin's heart that his cause is having to abandon his city, but we get it back eventually. Um, there were 11,000 Continental soldiers in these winter quarters and we did not have food, clothes, or housing for them. Many of them already didn't have socks or shoes. Some of them had no pants. Now, I have read this in several different places about the pants. And I just, I have to wonder, how does one fight a war with no pants? Especially when you are living in a time period before underwear has been invented. They weren't walking around in no boxers. Those weren't a thing yet. So you just hanging out in more ways than one? Like, I don't get it. I don't know. But, okay. It was probably like one person didn't have any pants because he got them, like, caught on something. And so then everybody was like, oh, my God, they don't even have pants. Um, so they're here all winter. During this winter, your um, American women, they're like trying to raise money. They're trying to get them supplies. Um, 
The food is very, very scarce, though. The It's it's a whole thing with, like, money and then rebe rebelling and blah, blah, blah. So they don't have a lot of food. And the soldiers are eating, like, broth and kind of like toast, but not. Um, it's almost like if you made cornbread out of wheat flour. I don't know if that clears this up for anybody, but that's kind of what it is. Some of them go without food for like days on end. And some of them are like, some of them are like, look, I would have taken food from anybody if anyone had had it, but no one had any. And he ends up finding like a pumpkin and he's like, oh, I can eat that. So he eats this pumpkin. I'm sorry. He is a private who then, you know, relayed his experiences in the war. So, like I said, um, American women try to help. They collect food, medicine, clothes, ammunition. Um, Martha Washington actually stays in Valley Forge to help take care of the wounded, the sick. But because all of these guys are here in this place and they are all going through the worst situation ever, um, this is very helpful to kind of make them into a real army. They've suffered together. Now they're going to fight together. And von Steuben uses all of this time to drill them and get them ready um, for actual battle with our British. So by 1778, after they make it through Valley Forge, they're ready to go. And the British are not expecting what comes next. 